Okay, well, that's a good introduction to my dear friend, uh, Sandy, and don't you love her? She just uh, has the answers to about everything, and she's been so helpful to me um, whenever we've, we've gotten together. And um, I enlisted her as a keynote speaker, but the way everything was working out when we were working with the town and the village for this day, uh, it, uh, it, it came out this way. But now you have your, your, uh, your chance, uh, and I will unshare my screen. Okay. First, let me welcome all of you today to the Save the Frog Day uh, Symposium. And as we uh, encourage uh, environmental conservation and, and sound uh, practices, it's also appropriate to honor the 50th anniversary of Earth Day because frankly, we're all in this together and uh, we all believe uh, in the importance of protecting precious environmental areas in our communities and around the planet, throughout the planet. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to share with you uh, some thoughts and some experience. I'm one of the early members of the Genesee Land Trust uh, Advisory Group. And uh, the Land Trust uh, was founded in 1989 by a small group of residents who really cared about preserving and protecting natural lands, waterways that enhance the quality of life in the greater Rochester region, protecting habitat, growing uh, food locally, and connecting to nature. As Margaret Mead said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has, and that's a very true and lasting statement. So for those of you who are participating today in this webinar, um, I do encourage you to do what you can to get involved because each one of us in our own way makes a difference. The Genesee Land Trust owns and manages uh, nature preserves in the region for the public to enjoy and for generations to come, and also partners with towns to create nature parks open to the public. Corbett's Glen Nature Park is one of those. Um, land trusts work with landowners to conserve farms and open space through permanent conservation easements. This protects farms from development and preserves open space. The trust ensures compliance with the agreement. The property owner cares for the land. Some of the areas that the Genesee Land Trust has focused on include the north coast along the uh, south shore of Lake Ontario, uh, connecting to nature through community conservation opportunities, uh, whether rural, suburban, or urban. Um, working uh, to preserve the community's farming heritage for our food sources locally as well as economic prosperity and protecting uh, significant habitats for wildlife, birds, butterflies, and so many other creatures that, that join us on this planet. The town of Brighton, where I served as supervisor for 20 years, undertook a comprehensive approach to protecting open space and preserving in sensitive environmental areas, um, making Brighton a green community. And it involved so many people in so many different ways. It's not something that one person can do on their own. So from the commitment of the town board, um, creating laws and regulations that are environmentally supportive and sensitive, working with the planning board as they review requests for rezoning site plans and subdivisions, 
having the funding to support the initiatives that will create parkland and protect open space. Um, the Conservation Board and Tree Council, we undertook um, an urban reforestation program because the um, uh, many of the elm trees that used to populate Brighton and the larger community uh, uh, really were impacted uh, and and so we needed to bring back trees and we used some uh, new varieties of elm trees as well as many others that are um, friendly uh, that this environment is friendly to and so forth so you can see that we we have focused uh, by including residents through the Green Brighton Task Force, which evolved into Color Brighton Green, and then created a Sustainability Oversight Committee, which is an ongoing uh, committee of the town. Um, how do we acquire and protect open space? Through public referendum, because we have to get the voters' approval to acquire land for public use, and also to bond or borrow funding to help support the acquisition uh, to the extent that that's needed. We also have benefited from donations of, of land. Um, in addition to purchases, the application of conservation easements with the cooperation of the property owner. And as a last resort, eminent domain though we don't like to use that once in a great while that may be necessary uh, to protect the public's interest um, we also relate very specifically to a variety of laws and uh, services and programs that are available from the federal and state government um, so we look at opportunities for using environmental protection overlay districts, um, classified wetlands, watershed guidelines, floodplains, um, erosion and sediment um, updating on a, on a regularly scheduled basis, our comprehensive or master plan, and doing an open space inventory update so that we know what we have and know where we want to go. The, the uh, Genesee Land Trust was very helpful when we uh, sought to create a, a townwide park system, but with a particular focus on Corbett's Glen uh, to create a nature park. It is a jewel in the town's park system. It's really, when you walk through there, you feel like you're in the Adirondacks in the middle of a, a developed residential area. It has two miles of eight foot wide trails that pass by meadows, wetlands, waterfalls, steep slopes in a secluded area full of native birds and wildlife. Uh, the 52 acre parcel has access from both Glen Road and Penfield Road. And I would say that today during the, the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, health crisis, uh, Corbett's Glen uh, Nature Park is currently, I believe, not available because so many people were using it and it is fragile, so it had to be protected. But there are other parks and areas that residents and, and people beyond Brighton can enjoy. But when this ends, um, you'll be more than welcome back to Corbett's Glen because it is, it is a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, we partnered with the Genesee Land Trust to acquire the South property. The property owners were initially seeking to develop um, townhomes on, on that property, and we had identified it through our park planning process and comprehensive plan update with the support of a public referendum that was approved by four to one um, to create a number of identified parks. And so the land trust assisted us by working with the property owner and negotiating on our behalf to acquire that land. And they also made a contribution financially as well as a commitment for a finite period to help maintain uh, the park. 
And we also worked with community groups like the Allens Creek Corbett's Glen Preservation Group and Brighton Neighbors United. The park entrance uh, from Penfield Road um, adds to the um, uh, to the uh, area, especially uh, where it's more wooded and there are steep slopes. Um, but if you if you visit Corbett's Glen. Um, after a good rain, you'll hear the sound of frogs singing to one another, or you might just spot one next to the um, to Allen's Creek shoreline near the waterfall. These are some images of Corbett's Glen Nature Park, and you can see why it was so important to the community, and in fact, to the region, to protect this for public park use. Um, in as a permanent park uh, and it had been identified by the county as the number one place in Monroe County that warranted preservation. More images of the Glen. The house, the Corbett house, was the original property, um, uh, a li original structure on that property and it is still um, a home um, but it is surrounded by parkland. This is a, a view of areas from the north entrance. So you can see that in addition to frogs, and I don't have pictures of birds here, but um, deer, uh, different types of, of trees and plants, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous area. And the, the fact that there are wetlands um, really make for great habitat for frogs. Legal interventions and activism to stop wetland destruction is something that is near and dear to the Brighton community. Um, neighborhood associations and civic community groups have led the way by uh, standing up for open space preservation and protection. Um, in 1992, back in 1989, uh, about 85% of the town was developed. And, and folks really wanted to find a way to make available for active and passive recreation and to protect environmentally sensitive areas um, an approach that would uh, enable the community to have a better quality of life and to, in fact, um, improve and strengthen property values. So through the, the residents' advocacy, through petitions, speaking at public meetings, uh, writing letters to the editor, providing neighborhood association support, and identifying government officials and candidates um, who share the vision and embrace the mission to educate and advocate for the desired envir environmental outcomes all work together to help us move forward with, um, with a town government that, that was of a like mind. So with transparency and community engagement in the process, uh, we updated the open space inventory and the comprehensive plan. We held multiple public hearings and created uh, with community involvement a very detailed parkland acquisition and development plan. And as I mentioned earlier, we held a public referendum which was required um, and it was approved overwhelmingly by the residents of the community who understood that it was going to cost them some more in their local taxes and their property taxes to uh, acquire and develop parkland, um, but they believed that that was really important and, and um, an aspect of living in Brighton that mattered to them and they were willing and able to pay for it. And the amount that they paid um, incrementally was really modest um, and the benefit they accrued um, was probably priceless. Uh, we worked with landowners for donations, easements, uh, purchase, and, um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, to a much lesser extent, um, discussions about eminent domain. It took 20 
plus years to create the townwide park system. Um, and that means having patience and perseverance, having a long range vision and the will to stick with it, um, to do the implementation in a thoughtful and careful way because you want to do things right the first time so that it's um, really at the end of the day a better result and, and um, less costly. And then transforming the vision into reality um, really meant everybody working together and having um, a shared community vision. Another park that we developed, um, and it's the most recent park acquisition, is the uh, Sandra Frankel Nature Park and Brickyard Trail. And I will say that it's always awkward for me to discuss and describe the park that carries my name. And I was honored to have this park named for me, um, not because of this park in particular, but because of our 20 year effort to create a townwide park system with about eight parks and major trails throughout the community for active and passive recreation, for youth sports, for adult um, uh, activity, for uh, enjoying nature and trails. The Brickyard Trail is particularly wonderful. Um, it connects Elmwood Avenue uh, to Westfall Road, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple of minutes. Um, but when you walk along the trail after a good rain, you will hear a croaking chorus of frogs communicating with one another. The sound is loud, it's pervasive, um, and it's it's cheering. And if you walk across the bridge um, over Buckland Creek, um, you might just spot a frog near the shoreline, which is what this particular frog image is. I saw this frog as I was taking a walk in the park, and it was just standing right there next to, next to the shore. During the 19th and uh, early 20th century, um, the land on which this nature park sits was originally part of the brick making industry, an early manufacturing industry in Brighton that, that provided bricks for many buildings in not only Brighton, but in the city of Rochester throughout the community. And that's because the soil was clay. Uh, so it was a, a key source material for making the bricks, the bricks of Brighton. Um, after it was dug, and the, the clay was dug and put on um, a narrow gauge railroad that transported the material to a manufacturing site near 12 Corners in Brighton. And so the uh, narrow gauge railroad path became the Brickyard Trail, and nature transformed the fields of empty clay soil into ponds and wetlands. I negotiated the purchase of this property in 2011, and in 2012, the 72-acre park was purchased and developed by the next administration, my successor, uh, Bill Maley, uh, with funding provided in the 2002 public referendum and a grant from New York State and a partial land donation. The Brickyard Trail, which is 0.8 miles of shared use for pedestrians and bicycles, runs between Elmwood Avenue and Westfall Road and contributes to the green necklace of parks and trails in the region. The landscape is an important economic ecological green space in the town, protecting uh, northern woodlands, providing a habitat for a wide variety of wildlife, and one of the largest wetlands in the urban area in Rochester's region. You can hear frogs, you can see turtles, fox, deer, birds and wildfire, wild, whoops, wild waterfowl, sorry about that, 
birds and waterfowl, and uh, fish and insects, to name a few. And I'd also note, although I was not fortunate enough to see it, um, an American eagle stopped by to visit our park one of the, uh, the days not so long ago. These are some images of the park from the trail. Um, the, you can see the, the frog in the park in, in the uh, creek right here. Um, dragonflies, uh, a delicious food for some of the, the creatures like frogs and, and, uh, and others. Um, there are uh, mallard ducks in the creek. Um, here, Canada geese have made this their, their home in the fall. Um, many insects uh, abound. And uh, it, it's just a place that, um, that has a lot of beauty, a lot of natural beauty, and, um, and makes this available uh, as a resource for nature study for students in the schools as well. A third area of interest from a frog perspective um, is the frog pond at the University of Rochester's Laser Lab on East River Road near Interstate 590. In the mid 2000s, when the University of Rochester Laser Lab's Omega EP uh, construction project went forward, uh, a big new part of that facility extended southward into the woods and wetlands and a large retaining pond had to be created because the project eliminated existing frog habitat. Town government, residents concerned about the environmental impact um, and the university and environmental agencies all worked together to find a solution. We learned that if a new pond were constructed in the vicinity of the original frog habitat, then frogs would relocate to the new pond. And indeed, that's just what they did. The new retaining pond is now a frog habitat, and a large earthen berm at the south end of the south parking lot and shipping area for the laser lab may in fact serve to keep frogs off the lot and therefore safe. The frogs were happy, residents were happy, town government was happy, and so was the laser lab. If you have a chance, stop by the pond behind the U of R laser lab after a good rain. And like the researchers who work at the lab, you can also hear the frogs croaking as they communicate with one another. This is the original area of frog habitat, but it was a much larger area. And so this is the retaining pond that has become the new frog pond at the laser lab. Um, and it's really been a real benefit and the collaboration among um, the university, the town, the community and environmental agencies was really terrific. Frogs do migrate from one place to another. And I know you're going to be hearing from um, Pittsford uh, following my presentation. And I would be remiss if I didn't note that these two frogs happen to be um, hopping along the sidewalk near the movie theater at Pittsford Plaza. So they do move around. And hopefully they found a happy home um, somewhere uh, off the sidewalk. I want to thank you all for participating in today's program, for caring about the importance of frogs in our ecosystem, and embracing the preservation of special environmental places. I know that we particularly appreciate the fact that frogs and tadpoles um, love to eat mosquitoes. Um, and mosquito larvae and uh and that's a help for us not only for our personal comfort but also for our health because of the um the diseases that mosquitoes can carry and transmit to humans um 
it's important that we save wetlands, which is uh, critical to our ecosystem. It's nature's way of cleaning water and providing important habitat. So what can you do? Get involved, follow the science, work to restore lost environmental protections that have happened at the federal level, and uh, work for sound climate change policies and practices so that we can reduce our carbon footprint and ensure that we have a healthy and safe uh, environment for everyone who's living on our planet and in our communities. So I want to thank Margot Fass, the Frog House, the Town of Pittsburgh, the Village of Pittsburgh, and all of you for your interest, for your commitment, and uh, for your caring. Thank you. I am now happy to see if anyone has any comments or questions they'd like to um, address. So I see, Sandy, that we uh, have a question. Let me try and get myself back up here. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what to, oh, maybe I know. Stop sharing. Yep, there you go. Got it. So there's a question from Bonnie asking if you could tell us more about Persimmon Park. Okay, Persimmon Park is located along the um, intersection of Highland Avenue and South Clinton. It's a 10 acre park uh, that the town acquired from the state of New York. Back in, I think it was the 70s, maybe it was a little earlier, um, the state uh, Department of Transportation had envisioned uh, the Genesee Expressway, which was going to come through the town of Brighton. And this and the another area that we acquired to become an affordable housing project, Deerfield Woods, um, were both part of that plan. There was so much community, we didn't live, I didn't live here at the time, but my understanding is that there was so much community pushback against having an expressway cut through the, the town of Brighton in that way, that, um, that the government, the state government abandoned the project and the land sat there for many, many, many years, unused on the, as part of the state's property. Um, it wasn't producing any revenue and it wasn't being used or developed for public use. So uh, led by Councilman Jim Vogel, who headed up a task force for uh, our administration at the time, um, uh, after I became supervisor, uh, sought the support of the state government uh, be, uh, because then Governor Mario Cuomo had identified um, open space preservation, uh, environmental protection, and affordable housing as two high priorities. So the state was willing to donate the land to the town of government, to the town of Brighton, as long as the land remained public park land. If it ever ceases to be public park land, it reverts to state ownership. But for now, it's a 10 acre park. Most of it is wetland and some woodland. There's a one acre section um, that was developed as uh, an area where folks could come in and could have picnics and, and whatnot. But, um, but mainly uh, it is wetland and, and uh, a, a nature habitat. Thank you. I want to um, thank you for your uh, leadership in the town of Brighton when you were the supervisor here. Uh, you probably don't know this, but um, the, many of these initiatives are the reason that 10 years ago when I was figuring out where in Rochester to live that I came to Brighton um, because of all of the initiatives that were happening at that time. And so oh, great. Yeah, I've been really excited about that. And uh, and out in West Brighton, I have the benefit of a lot, a lot of green space. So you I'm do. That. You do. And in West Brighton, one of the areas that that you now have as a as a public uh, nature park uh, is Lynch Woods. 
um, which is, uh, I think it's about 70 acres or so, um, and it's all natural. It, it has not been developed with trails, but, but it's an area that people can explore and see what's going on out there in nature. And then adjacent to it is the Lehigh Valley Multi-Use Trail, which we also developed in partnership with the town of Henrietta and the city of Rochester and New York State as well as the Genesee Transportation Council's directing some federal funds to help us create that trail. So it that trail, along with others, links up with the Erie Canal Trail and other regional trails so that people who want to bicycle or hike uh, can, uh, can enjoy the connection both for recreation as well as commuting to the University of Rochester or RIT. The, all those things are part of the reason I chose to live in West Brighton. I can go out my door and walk or ski or um, ride my bike for days without um, being on a road. It's fabulous because I have really yes. access to the Lehigh Valley Trail and the canal path. And, can and West Brighton, well, I was going to say West Brighton, um, because of its proximity to the um, to the Genesee River, um, is really uh, a major floodplain, and so there is limited development there. And that's another way that we can protect and preserve some of this open space and habitat. I happen to live on the property that's the lowest on Red Creek. Uh, which, as you know, flows into the Erie Canal just uh, east of where the canal and the river intersect. And I've developed a relationships with a uh, relationship with the folks down at the Court Street Bridge and have invited them to come to my yard anytime they're worried about flooding because my I'm the my property is the canary in the coal mine <laughs> oh. <laughs> for when we get extra rain. So um, so I actually feel an extra burden of responsibility for what I do here because of my um connection with the watershed uh, living right on the edge of it so and, and we do have a lot of frogs here um i'm kind of curious uh one of the things that um a fantasy that i have for brighton um is that all that property around buckland park might uh and i'd love to be part of this get developed into a combination of a, a working organic farm um an orchard uh more community garden beds and an educational center that uh, focuses on environmental and gardening education for the community. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about whether something like that's possible and you're so, so great at collaborations, what uh, collaborations would you suggest to explore that? Well, you know, the idea of creating a community farm um, and uh, having an informational or educational center, having a community center. A lot of these ideas have been brought forward over time. And um, when the opportunity arises to acquire more of that land, um, the town has acquired some of the additional land, but there's still more that may be possible. Um, uh, some of those things uh, could happen. It would take uh, a lot of community support and a willingness to invest uh, in in the community in that way. Um, but I would I would encourage you to reach out to the town government today and let them know that that you have an interest in seeing that type of thing happen. Uh, over over the years, we and and the subsequent um, administration uh, have accepted a variety of suggestions for how that land might be used and part of it will depend upon the needs of the community at the time um, but you know your suggestions are terrific and uh, it would be exciting to see some of that happen Thank you. Thanks for the encouragement on that. Uh, one of the things I think that we're learning in this current um, situation that we're all in is the importance of local food systems, of having um, you know diversified food systems, and also of, of uh, job opportunities for people. So there are a lot of uh, problems or a lot of um, 
uh, things that could get addressed by creating something like that there. I don't know if you're aware, but the Buckland House, which sits at the front on Westfall Road, um, it it's a, a local landmark which the which we uh, renovated and restored, and it's available for the community to use. And the family, the Buckland family that lived there, and it also uh, became for a time a home for. Um, I believe for uh, orphans, um, but they had a, a small orchard adjacent to the house. So, th so that kind of use has been there in the past. Um, of course, the deers would love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. That is. Uh, that's another thing we have an abundance of uh, all over this part of Brighton for sure, and including including there as well. Um, and I'll just uh, start seeing other questions coming in. I have one that might be of more general interest. I'm curious if there are any other projects that you personally would like to see happening in our area that would uh, that are related to what we're talking about today. Well, you know, one of the things that um, that I would like to see more of um, would be um, charging stations for electric cars because as more and more of us acquire that type of transportation, having access to rapid charging stations will be really important because you have to have that if, if you're going to uh, go anywhere. Our family has had, um, we're on our third volt, and unfortunately GM has discontinued the uh, production of, of that particular car but there are many others that are coming online. And so from the perspective of air quality and um, uh, carbon footprint reduction, I think that would be an important thing to continue. There are some charging stations, one in the Town of Brighton library parking lot, um, but clearly we're gonna need more as more people uh, move to alternative energy transportation. Um, in terms of land use, uh, it is local government that basically controls what happens with land. And so looking at the areas that we have in our community as well as um, beyond, um, having a plan and working with residents to um, put those plans in place and, and turn them into reality will be important uh, from the perspective of protecting environmental spaces. And one of the challenges that local communities, that property taxpayers will face, um, will be the reality of the economy. And because we know that the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, crisis has had a real impact on individuals' um, income, on uh, whether they have jobs, whether their small businesses uh, can continue. Those will be factors that will drive whether there'll be resources available um, to fund local community projects. So to the extent that people um, can contribute, can make donations, can work with organizations like the Genesee Land Trust uh, and, and, and other not-for-profits, I think would be beneficial. Um, but keeping um, nature healthy is, is key. And, and also having communities um, formally adopt um, sustainability plans. Um, and recycling programs exist now, but to do yard waste collection where they aren't currently doing that. And it, it's, some of it is complicated depending upon um, where that, that can be done, where the space is available to do that composting. Um, so there are a lot of options and a lot of opportunities, and I'm glad to see so many people stepping up and wanting to get involved and as Margaret Mead said, it's going to take a small group of dedicated people, paraphrasing her, to make this happen. Um, but it's going to take 
people to be active, to speak up, to stand up, um, and and to really make that investment. Just a, a quick note um, before we move on to to the rest of the governmental section of uh, this pr presentation. You showed the pictures of the frogs in the in the uh, mall. And uh, it's a, a same kind of phenomenon, I think, as uh, the deer uh, coming into residential neighborhoods, which I saw one just up the street uh, at, uh, at uh, South Clinton and, and Rockingham. So um, it, it's, it was just adorable the way you had the little frogs hopping from the existing wetland into the, <laughs> into the retaining pond. I didn't miss that. But, uh, but generally speaking, that's the way to do it because uh, someone inherited a pond, a frog pond, when uh, she purchased a house and she wanted to get rid of the frog pond because she didn't like it. And uh, so then there are all kinds of state rules about, uh, about uh, transporting wildlife and it, it, we couldn't just take them over to the Erie Canal Nature Preserve because, uh, because they spread disease conceivably and so forth. So, I don't know what she's ended up doing, but I certainly learned a lot about uh, the the dangers. They they might travel a long way, uh, but uh, but I hope they're not learning to eat uh, trash the way the the uh, seagulls do, the frogs, and they will be going all over the malls these days. But in any case, um, oh, I hear frogs. I think. But anyway, so I think that uh, it's important for people to know not to, to transport frogs more than a short distance. I, I mean, make a new habitat. But if you build a habitat and put some frog dunk in it or donut, then uh, frog donut, then uh, you won't have mosquitoes and the frogs will come. But anyway, thank you. A real keynote speech. And uh, I, I hope uh, that uh, the all the Pittsford leaders have a chance to to have heard you, if not now, then a little later. And I'm, I'm happy to share the, uh, the PowerPoint if, if folks are interested. Well, we are uh, recording it, and uh, so people can just get your part, which was okay. marvelous. And by the way, I presume you took all those photos yourself. And, I did. Uh, you I did. are an amazing photographer. You Thank have you. an editor coming up after you uh, in the form of Rob Corby because he loves to take pictures as well. I haven't seen Bill's, but here comes a good picture of Bill. Oh, well, I put them both together. Oh. Uh, that adorable picture of Bill. <laughs> he is such a servant. And uh, this mafia looking guy on the right, he is such a love and so full of passion for life and nature. So uh, this is a fantastic team. They've been working together for many years. And uh, we're talking about cooperation and, and uh, th this is the quintessential cooperative team. And I don't know, uh, Rob and, and Bill, do you wanna talk together? Or do you wanna both be unmuted at the same time or do you wish to uh, take one turn and then the other? Bill? Hello, Bill, I know you're there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can okay. hear you, Rob. Can you hear me? Is that Bill? That's me. Yes, Hi, okay. Bill. I can hear Hi, you Bob. both. Oh yeah, we should both be on at the same time. All right, awesome. Okay, take it away. Well, good. Well, uh, it, it's always um, fun to have an opportunity to talk about our Erie Canal Nature Park and Preserve Project. And um, this is something Bob Corby and I have been working on together for since about uh, 2014. And that's pretty much where it started. Um, it was one of the first things I looked at when I came into office as town supervisor in 2014, the town of Pittsford owned and still owns about 15 acres of land in a fairly natural state right on the canal. And if you, um, if you were standing in the parking lot where the, uh, the Talbots and the jewelry store 
uh, are. And looking across the canal, basically, you're, you're looking at that parcel. And the village owns a parcel adjacent to it, further just per, to the immediate east of it. So altogether, there are 30 unspoiled acres in the canal, about half owned by the town and half owned by the village. And there had been a um, plan put in place to develop both the town and village sides of that property. And as Mayor Corby and I got to talking about that, um, it didn't seem to make a tremendous amount of sense to us to have unspoiled land like that on the canal uh, as a site for development, either for municipal buildings or for uh, private development. And so we came up with the idea of uh, maybe devoting this to the purpose of a, uh, a nature preserve. And um, on the town side, we moved ahead. With Bob's help, we uh, applied for a grant from the state, which we won back in 2014, to go ahead and uh, create the Erie Canal Nature Park and Preserve. And it seems a little incongruous. You think, uh, well, wait a minute, you have a, you have a parcel of land and it is in its natural state and it is unspoiled. So what exactly do you have to do if you want to make a nature preserve out of it? Well, there's some things you really do need to do. Uh, you need to make sure the purpose is for the public to have access to it. So it's important to be able to put trails in so people can appreciate the uh, different natural features of this, um, of this nature preserve. And uh, it also gave us an opportunity to be able to use that trail system to be able to connect up the Erie Canal Trail with the Auburn Trail that is just behind on the other side of the property. And um, what I would uh, like to do, if I can share the screen here, I'll just take you through, this was a presentation to our town board back in October. And uh, this will tell you a bit give you some visuals about where the property is and what we're planning to do. So it involves the master plan, which is done, the design and implementation of the trail, which I just discussed, and some amenities and wetland improvements. And then there is a reconstruction of a historic barn on the property, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, this gives you an overview of the property. Uh, you can see the canal there, and you can see that green area. That's the, that's the project location. So immediately to the right of that roughly rectangular parcel that's captioned project location is the village, the adjacent village-owned property. And that just shows some land swaps that are part of getting a coherent uh, parcel there. So you, you see an idea of where the trail is going to go, the master plan, and this was um, our landscape uh, architect did this is the base of the topography and soil conditions, and what was going to get people closest to the natural features that we're trying to um, uh, be able to make uh, accessible. So there are a number of interesting, um, interesting aspects of this property, and uh, one that's um, highly appropriate to the uh, Save the Frogs effort. So uh, there are uh, remnants of the old, um, the old trolley, uh, the old trolley system. Uh, there, is, there are meadow overlooks and there are frog ponds there. There are wetlands. This was once owned, this property. You can see the four frog ponds up to the upper left corner of the, um, of the photograph, of the aerial photograph. This used to be owned by a scientific company, Ward Scientific, I think it was called, that uh, raised frogs that uh, were the frogs that were sent out to high schools across the country for students to dissect in biology class. So when uh, wards packed up, uh, the frogs were left behind and there is still an abundance of aquatic amphibious life uh, in those four frog ponds and there are wetlands all around them. So as you can see by the orientation of the trail, uh, the intention is to be able to give uh, the public a view of that particular area of the um, of the property, and uh, you know, in a way that doesn't compromise its uh, its natural state. So, while we have this slide up, I will just tell you that um, 
Uh, the, te uh, the work is already underway. All of the approvals were obtained by the beginning of the year and the work started. Uh, so we have a temporary access road to the site that's been completed. We've cleared the trail alignment. So that line that you see there, that has been done. Uh, the erosion control measures have been taken care of and the rough grading. And um, some surveying is um, some surveying is going on right now. The bids for an elevated boardwalk that's going to be part of this, and you'll see in the how that will be used when we get uh, some of the further slides that show examples of this. Uh, it makes it the wetland area of the uh, parcel a lot more uh, accessible. So let's carry on. Here are some of the trolley remnants. Bob, chime in anytime you want to comment on any of these uh, photos. You and I have been over this before, and I know you. Uh, this is all second nature to you. Here's what the parcel looked like back in 1924. There actually was a barn on the property back in the day. And uh, the town, and we'll have a picture of it coming up before long. So here's an example of where the trolley tracks went through. This will be the Creekside rest area. You can see the existing creek bank and some of the features in that area. That's looking in another direction. The elevated trail. This is not our parcel of property, but this just gives you a, this is an illustration of what uh, an elevated trail like this looks like, I'm sure. Any of you who have been, um, we have some of the trails up by uh, Durand Eastman Park uh, near the uh, lake shore, you will see an extensive boardwalk trail like this. And that's the kind of thing we have in mind for the, uh, uh, for the wetland area of the nature preserve. Here's what it looks like now at the meadow area. And we will have an overlook at the frog pond and a similar overlook at the meadow and at different points along the trail. And the goal is this will not be part of the first phase of the project. Uh, this will be at a, a later phase. We want to get the, get the public accessibility into the parcel as the, um, uh, as the uh, a prime goal right now. But the town acquired uh, the uh, historic Cass Smith Snyder barn uh, this was once on a horse farm on Calkins Road up until not too many years ago. And um, at the behest of Historic Pittsford, um, we worked out an arrangement whereby the town could purchase uh, this barn for preservation, which we did. And it is, uh, it is disassembled and ready to be reassembled on the site where a barn once stood when that was privately owned property. And this gives you a rough idea of the preliminary layout. You see the canal at the bottom right of the slide. You can see the, the trail that's going to be uh, there that connects, will connect the canal trail that goes back to the frog ponds and to the Auburn Trail. And the idea is to put the barn approximately where you see it now. And this can be used as an interpretive center among other things. So this would be the view. This is looking east from the site of approximately where the barn would be situated, looking east into the uh, into the village which at the railway bridge you see there. And this just gives you uh, some other ideas of how this will be put together, reconstructed, and what it will look like the different elevations once that part of the work is done. And this just gives you an idea of the kind of uh, stone that would be used for the foundation and some of the options of what could be done for the uh, for the barn doors. And this is the schedule. We are on schedule for this uh, for this project. Um, all the approvals and permits have been obtained and um, we are on hold just a little bit at this point on the uh, getting the materials for the boardwalk because of the whole uh, coronavirus uh, shut down, but our park crews are working uh, with the installation of the, uh, the permanent trail and the, um, and the restorations that need to be done. So we expect to complete this and have the, an opening for the, the new Erie Canal Park and Preserve 
uh, by the end of the summer. And one of the things that we made sure to do was uh, the planning of this project for there were there were because it's in the village we would have had the uh, village integrally involved in the planning for this uh, in any event. But also remember the village owns its own parcel of 15 unspoiled acres immediately to the east of this and so we worked together the mayor and the representative of the village government uh, were on our planning committee so that everything we've done on the town side of the property would be compatible with whatever plans the village might wish to pursue to uh, use its parcel for the same purposes, which would create for practical purposes a, uh, a nature preserve along the canal uh, of about 30 acres. And uh, to me at least, I think that's the best and highest use of that land on the canal. And it's great because it is a park right in the heart of our village, which is the heart of the community. And if I could just add, um, I want to address two things to um, add some additional information to what Bill just said. Uh, first, I want to give a little background on what happened before we started on the actual park project in this area and how it relates to zoning, conventional zoning, and really the reevaluation of priorities that's happened in both the town and village of Pittsburgh and is embodied in the comprehensive plans that both entities have recently completed. And lastly, I'd just like to talk a little bit about why the biology and ecosystem of this property and preserving it is so timely at the present time. Um, I've been mayor for 25 years, and um, many years ago when zoning was first adopted, zoning throughout the United States is based on uh, zoning that was developed in Cleveland in the 1920s called Euclidean zoning, which is based on, you know, numerical dimensions and the goal of separating uses so neighborhoods are protected from industries and, and other um, uh, commercial uses that might cause uh, noxious fumes or other hazards and reduce the quality of life. Over the years, as zoning has evolved, it's been applied uh, abstractly in a two-dimensional two way and, and generally the theme in many communities especially suburban communities is how do you maximize tax revenue and get the, the greatest return for potential development. Uh, what we've come to as a society to learn and certainly uh, Pittsburgh has been a pioneer in this philosophy is that really quality of life is enhanced greatly by amenities and we are quite fortunate to have a legacy of amenities in our community, including things like Men and Ponds Park, obviously the Erie Canal, uh, the extensive trail system that the town of Pittsburgh has developed, the walkable historic core of our village, which is an amenity for all uh, Pittsburgh residents and um, in most normal times is a place where we feel a sense of community and it's a place where we gather. Uh, so this emphasis on historic preservation, walkability, and understanding the, the factors that contribute to our personal health um, have all been encompassed in the recommendations of both the town and the village's comprehensive plan. Now, as I was saying, when I started as mayor, this parcel was owned for an industrial use. Uh, when we did a comprehensive plan in, uh, beginning in 1998, uh, one of the first things the committee realized that to put an industrial use in this area, number one, would contribute more truck traffic to already at that time clogged Monroe Avenue and drive truck traffic through the village. It would destroy environmentally sensitive wetland areas that exist in this area. There isn't good or safe access to this property to Monroe Avenue because of the grade coming down from uh, the, the uh, bridge on Monroe Avenue. And lastly, it's just not the highest and best use for the canal, which for, for years was ignored and overlooked and now has been recognized as really one of the prime recreational, recreational assets in New York State. So the first phase in rezoning the area was rezoned to residential thinking that perhaps residents could take advantage of that. Um, <clears throat> but even that 
uh, you know, closer analysis of, of that use, uh, there were some obstacles. Number one, uh, we have a traffic capacity problem in this area, the issue of access, and, and really, rather than privatizing uh, canal frontage in the, that remains open land in the village, we uh, conversations with residents and other stakeholders revealed that most people felt, why shouldn't we leave this public? And so when Bill and I first discussed this several years ago, I enthusiastically supported Bill's proposal um, because it, 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 it efficiently hits so many bars. It, it connects the Auburn Line Trail with the canal with a clear passage. Uh, it provides a new opportunity for access to recreational open space and uniquely because this parcel um, by some miracle did not get developed, this open space is right in the walkable heart of our community. And very, very few communities of our scale have an asset like this, this close to, to downtown Pittsburgh. And for that, we're very, very fortunate. And certainly the, the other unique aspect, saving a historic English barn, which was a collaborative effort between historic Pittsburgh and the town of Pittsburgh, are very far-sighted things. Um, not only is it sustainable for the reuse of materials and high quality materials, it also preserves the architectural and historic uh, agricultural traditions of our community. So the town really does deserve kudos for that. Um, <clears throat> so when we did our most recent community plan, the, the issue was reevaluated again. Uh, this time the input from, from residents was very clear. Um, uh, there was overwhelming support to not only support what the town is proposing, but also to use uh, the 13 acre uh, village DPW property of which only about an acre and a half is used for our village garage and village yard. Um, and it, it actually was used to be a village brush dump. Uh, the village bought it in the 1930s uh, when the village uh, built a sewage treatment plant, which was decommissioned uh, back in the 1980s. Um, so it's, it's really been unused since that time and it's grown up into secondary growth and it's a remarkable place because here in the congested heart of Pittsburgh, you can walk there any time of year. It's amazingly silent. You can see coyotes, fox, and wildlife and have access to the vernal ponds, wetlands, emerging woodlands uh, that, that really are the hallmark of the town's portion of the property and it, it really is a a microcosm of the environmental resources in the northeastern United States that currently are most at risk. And that's why it's also a great educational tool because it encompasses multiple and different types of wetlands. Vernal ponds, and, and I should explain that vernal ponds are areas that in the spring where um, that <coughs> when it is wet uh, become ponds and then dry up later in the spring but things like salamanders, frogs, and other species are dependent on vernal ponds uh, for, and they are the foundation of the food chain that, that not only feeds in, um, things like birds, but it goes all the way on up to us. And so uh, preserving this um, right in the heart of our community is a huge uh, educational resource uh, for young people in our community and for generations to follow us. So this really is uh, something that we can all be proud of. Bill, any other comments? We are looking forward to the opening of uh, the Erie Canal Nature Park and Preserve later this year. Great. And what, what are you doing, the uh, Bob, the, um, now you have the Arboretum Project going on, don't you? Our, our intent is because the village DPW property has become a re-emergent re woodland that eventually, you know, we have some other priorities right now and certainly because of the crisis, this is a longer range goal. But the goal is to start seed a, uh, an appropriate uh, hardwood woodlot um, displaying native uh, Northeastern United States, native deciduous and um, uh, uh, trees like white pine and uh, Canadian hemlocks. So that would be the long-term plan. Uh, the reason that makes sense is right now a significant portion of the trees of the uh, parcel was planted with um, red, uh, red spruce back in the 1930s. 
Uh, those spruce plantations are aging out and will be supplanted by other species. So there's a great opportunity here to reintroduce species like red oak, white oak, um, shagbark hickory, and sugar maple. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, uh, you know, a wonderful, you know, supplement and augmentation to uh, this first part that we're doing um, with the nature park and preserve. And um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased that, you know, and you, you mentioned this before, but it's just one more thing that makes, um, makes our town and our village unique, I think, that, you know, we will have this much open space in the village itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking at it from a town-wide perspective, we have fewer parks in the northern part of the town than we have in the southern part of the town. So this will uh, help to uh, correct that imbalance as well. Great. Couldn't agree with you more, Bill. So this interaction and collaboration between the two of you is so amazing. And I noticed that there are a couple of Pittsford residents on on this uh, webinar right now. But as Sandra mentioned earlier, uh, you, you have to have community involvement. And so how are we going to get your messages, particularly your two this afternoon, out to the general village and, and town population? Because this is a great rollout of something that affects every citizen in, in your two communities that are one. And uh, how can we get it out? We are recording these sessions, but uh, well, should we have it on a continuous like, loop from the village and the town so people can hear it? I'd like to make one suggestion. Several years ago, um, well, and I should say regularly, almost every year at the village, we have some interaction with students in the Pittsburgh Central School District. And uh, we've had students looking at transportation issues, at history, uh, at architecture, and at the natural environment. We've had scouts engaged in, in a, a diverse array of projects that have spruced up areas of the village and done other things um, that have made our, our, our village center a better place. Specifically on this parcel, uh, several years ago, we had a fourth grade class at <clears throat> the Menden Center Elementary School that uh, executed a brilliant project with four plaques um, basically explaining uh, the important environmental role of monarch butterflies which are endangered and those plaques are uh, they exist today there we located them along the towpath in the area of the new nature park because uh, the ecosystems that exist within this area are prime habitat for monarch butterflies and I think as the trail and the features that the town is constructing are rolled out there will be a, a continual opportunities for students in our community uh, to come to this as a study lab and learn from all the natural things that are occurring on this piece of property. I'm talking about a referendum from the citizens who play, they pay taxes. Also, I know the importance of the school and so a number of things have interfered with my getting in touch with, with uh, the very school people, including people who were gonna volunteer if we'd had a real day but uh, including the virus, of course. But the question is, is the, the citizens who pay taxes, how, how do you broadcast to them that uh, they need to get out and support this project? I was watching a webinar from Kerry Kreiger, the founder of Save the Frogs last night, and in, uh, in, I think it was in India, that they showed how they got all these community volunteers and, and involved and so forth. How can, how can we light a little fire? Well, I, I think as municipal officials, uh, we can educate, but we really don't lobby for um, agendas or even, even sometimes our own initiatives. Uh, we can disseminate information and Bill does an excellent job through that through the town newsletter, but we really are prohibited to trying to persuade uh, public opinion in one direction or the other. That being said, there's been a history of community partnerships in this community uh, with groups like Historic Pittsburgh that have handled the preservation aspect. Uh, but I think that's exactly what um, our communication and engagement with the Sa Save the Frogs or the Frog House organization in Pittsburgh, uh, it's a great opportunity because I think uh, the Frog House organization has great potential to uh, leverage uh, these natural assets that now will become accessible 
and to raise public awareness about the environment that surrounds us. Yes, we do have hundreds of petitions to present to someone someday. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it is a wonderful conjunction of opportunity and uh, motivation here, uh, Margot, because of what you're trying to do for frogs and the, uh, the uh, specific uh, details of this property, having been a place where frogs were raised and that is teeming with uh, amphibious life. And, you know, I, I think Bob mentioned something earlier that ties into your question about how we get this out and how we got public involvement. Roughly at approximately the same times, the village and the town were going through the process of adopting uh, updated comprehensive plans. And the uh, Erie Canal Park and Preserve and the future of the village property that, that's adjacent to it, uh, these figured prominently in both the village's comprehensive planning process and in the town's comprehensive planning process. So this is something that probably more than some other initiatives, uh, people in the town are well aware of. And as you might imagine, we're not about to do this and then keep it a secret. We're gonna let people know that uh, this is there for them to enjoy once the, uh, once the trails open. I, I think another thing that it's, um, people will find this naturally because uh, the, the towpath trail itself is so heavily used as is the Auburn line trail. And this really isn't the nexus of our trail network. So uh, I'm not worried that people won't discover this. I think it's going to be a very popular, popular destination in our town. It is already uh, for years, people like myself that live in the village have walked through this area. Uh, because it's a wonderful place to uh, get a little access to quiet, peace, solitude, and a green natural environment. Yeah, I think it's really going to open up the, um, the Auburn Trail to more visitors, Bob, because so many people use that canal trail and the towpath. And uh, when they see the new trail coming off of it, people are going to go up to explore. I, I, I agree. I agree. Very exciting um, project ahead. I can't wait to see it completed. Is that barn um, sort of where or near where your current village maintenance uh, property is? You no, know, the uh, uh, we are storing the vines. I said it was uh, it was dismantled and everything was labeled for reconstruction, and uh, we are storing the historic barn inside another historic barn the town owns. On uh, if you go down Jefferson Road, down going down toward the Kings Bend Park, the um, Bob, what are the names of, the, the, of that family farm, those barns, the yellow barns on the left as you're going Charles west. Zorno Farm, and it was Zorno. built by Frederick Zorno, who started, he's my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather's son. He started the Zorno Funeral Home. He originally built barns, and then he figured out it was easier to build, build coffins, and that's how the funeral home started. <laughs> So, th so we're storing the one historic barn inside another historic barn uh, until it's ready to be re-erected on the- No, uh, I meant where uh, will it now. be? Re you showed a picture of, of where it will be erected near the, the dissecting- The landscape farm, architect but... has carefully uh, done a site evaluation along the bend in the canal there. And they've carefully oriented the barn. So it, when the, the large doors that'll be on the side of the barn are open, there's going to be a beautiful frame view looking east towards the West Shore Railroad Bridge. So it'll be located about 500 feet beyond the village of Pittsford Yard and DPW Garage. Uh, on the west of it? Or the west, east? West of it, across from where Talbot's is located yeah, yeah, off of yeah. Monroe Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Rob, I think it's uh, it's excellent that the two of you are um, a role model for other communities. And um, and we hope that this will happen all in every community around our county and the in our United States. But I think you have a visual virtual tour to take us on. Don't look panicked. Uh, I, I did not do that, I'm afraid, because of <laughs> my budget process this week has been fully engaging me. So I was hoping to have a PowerPoint presentation but sadly, uh, I did not have time to get that done. And I apologize, Margo, but I, well, it just was I, not possible. But I, I would love, uh, as the weather improves, 
uh, to lead a walking tour through this property uh, sometime this summer when, uh, when conditions allow something like that uh, to occur. I would like to propose, uh, I mean, technically we were going to end at two o'clock other than the virtual t uh, tour, but uh, Patty, if you could just unmute everybody uh, of the panelists and, and um, so we can say hello and goodbye to each other. Hi, Sandy. Hi there, good to see you. Good, good to I, I, I wanna to come to your opening. Oh, absolutely, you will be on the list. We will love it, I'll put you great, on Great, great. I'd love it. I'd love it. Thank you, Margo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Margo. Margo, thank you. And thank you for including us. Oh, we've learned exactly. so I'm, much. It's, it's been thrilled. so informative and educational. Well, yes, for me, too. I just am thrilled with your thank you, Margo. and commitment and, and uh, thank you very much. And patience <laughs> and encouragement. Margo, thank you for all you've done for Pittsford and the environment so and your. your Commitment is incredible. Look, Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> There's uh, one last question. So it's actually a comment from Catherine. Mm -hmm. And she says, time zip by. And I certainly found that too. So I'm going to put up a little ad <sighs> right now. <clears throat> so if anybody is still on, um, you can visit a frog house as soon as it's uh, virtually open. Uh, I mean, physically open. Uh, you can walk by it. Uh, there's a little mailbox on the back side of it. And uh, we're honoring life one frog at a time. And you can find me in the website uh, as indicated. The website is new and I am newly 501c3 incorporated for sure for legal. And uh, this is our second annual Pittsford Save the Frogs Day. And thank you so much all again. Thank you. Margo, you're making...